Hey, this is the 80 Slasher Librarian, just letting you guys know if you enjoy the content here on the channel and want to support the channel, click on the Patreon link in the description below. As I'm not allowed to monetize the channel here on YouTube, I depend on you guys to keep this channel going and growing by becoming patrons of the channel and sponsoring at the Patreon page. There's great rewards for doing so in tiers as low as 2 to $5 per month. Hey everybody, it's CJ Graham, Jason, Friday the 13th Part 6. Hell Cop and Highway to Hell. Hey, I just want to make sure you guys know you're listening to the 80s slasher librarian. Hi, this is Kane Hodder. Better known as Jason from Friday the 13th, Victor Crowley from Hatchet. I've also played BTK, Ed Gein. Let's just say I've murdered a lot of people. In fact, I've murdered more people on film than any actor in history. So just keep that in mind. You are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Keep listening, or I'll kill you. Just cause you're playing cool Don't think you got this fool tonight Friday the 13th, Part 4, The Final Chapter, a fan novelization by Landon Turner. Chapter 8 The hot, steaming water sprayed down on the nude, love-making couple, ricocheting off of the glass shower walls and forming a pool at their feet. It was happening. It was actually happening. Sarah thought as Doug found his way inside of her. Everything was melting inside of her and mingling together to build a huge wave of pleasure and intense ecstasy that started deep in her pelvis and diffused into the rest of her body. She let out a deep moan of pleasure, the steaming hot water running down her back. Doug pressed her gently against the glass shower door, moving with her. How had she been scared of this? This was... this was fucking amazing, she thought, just the two of them alone with the steam. It was even better than Sam had described. She understood now why Sam slept around so much, but Sarah didn't want to have sex like Sam did. She was glad she waited until the time was right. And the time had been right. Sarah was so tired of being scared of saying no, of giving in to her fears and not allowing herself to enjoy things in life. Whether or not it was drugs or sex, she always heard her dad's voice in her mind, warning her that boys only wanted one thing. But after all, what did he know? He didn't understand. Doug was a good guy and waited until Sarah was ready. She felt everything relaxing inside of her. Finally, after all this time being so worried about everything, it all didn't matter. Nothing mattered except for her and Doug and the hot steam that swirled around them. Doug moved his hips a bit faster and began to voice his pleasure too, until they both crescendoed with the climax of their lovemaking coming to an end. Doug pulled away, kissing Sarah tenderly. Sarah melted into him, her legs weak, still filling him inside of her. She kissed him harder, her hands finding every nook and cranny of his body, touching him, exploring him. Sarah finally pulled away and stared up at him, mesmerized. They both stood wrapped in each other's arms for a few minutes, feeling the heat of the water and bathing in the steady flow of spray that misted them from the shower head. What had she been so afraid of? They used protection. It was with someone she loved, and she couldn't wait to do it again. Sarah kissed him again, climbed out of the shower, and wrapped herself in a towel. Sarah, I think I'm in heaven, Doug said through the running water. Sarah smiled at him, looking back over her shoulder. I think I'm in love, Doug kissed her again. I'll meet you in the bottom bunk, Sarah said with a wink, and left the room glowing radiantly. Doug looked up at the steam of the water flowing from the shower head, letting it wet his hair, and run down his back. 
he began to exuberantly sing Tangerine to himself. He couldn't believe they actually had sex. Was he dreaming? Sarah Williams actually just fucked him. Unbelievable. He remembered in seventh grade when she was known around school as the prude. She was quite a sight, too. Glasses, acne, braces, the works. She looked like a regular geek. But when she hit ninth grade, puberty hit her full force and the boys were noticing, including himself. On the first day of ninth grade, she came to school with her mousy brown hair curled and highlighted and in heels. Paul actually went for Sarah first, but when she wouldn't have sex, he went for Sam. Doug got the rebound, and sure, he was upset that she wouldn't fuck him. But there was something about Sarah that Doug really liked. Something sensitive and really special, different than the other girls. He meant what he said to her on the trail today. He really did love her. It was a deeper love than anything he'd had with other girls. Something more intimate. He could sit and have a deep conversation with Sarah just about life, family, their problems, their insecurities. It allowed for a much more intimate relationship, and it allowed for them to just have the best sex Doug had ever had. God, he loved those types of girls. The ones that don't give in to sex on the first date. The down-to-earth girls always ended up being the best sex. Probably had something to do with all that sexual frustration. Sarah was one of those girls that you had to get to know them as people first, and deep down, that's what most everyone wants. At least Doug thought. Paul, deep down, loved those kinds of girls, but he suppressed it with his macho girl crazy attitude that always fucked him in the end, like tonight with Sam. Sam was that type of girl, but suppressed it with jealousy and bitchiness. They were deep down right for each other, but their egos usually led to big blowouts like tonight. Where the hell were those two? Hell, they were probably screwing their heads off in the woods. God, he loved her. He really did. She was smart and beautiful and liked to just chill out every once in a while and enjoy the silence and really talk about serious shit. Damn, when he told Paul that Sarah had actually let him have sex with her, imagine the look on his face. Yeah, there was something truly special about Sarah, and he was glad that he was her first time. He wanted it to be perfect, and it was. Doug had even thought about marrying her, even though Paul constantly told him never to get tied down to one chick. But Sarah was the type of girl you marry, Doug had said. After all, what was so wrong about settling down? He didn't have to ask Sarah just yet. They could wait until after school was over and when they both got steady jobs and were settled down in the house somewhere. They could move off to the city, have a few kids. He could go to school and study to be a doctor like he always wanted. Sarah could find her a part-time job and they'd be set for life. Doug was snapped out of his thoughts by the bathroom door creaking open and then closing. Hey, Sarah, did you change your mind? There was no response. A shadow fell over the glass shower door. The glass was blurred and Doug couldn't see out of it. Hop back in, Sarah, there's plenty of room. We could sing a duet, he joked. Still no response. The shadow grew larger. Who is that, Polly? Hey, Polly, is that you? Doug asked. Still no answer. The shadow moved closer to the shower door. Doug let the bar of soap slip from his hand. Whoops, dropped my bar of soap, Polly, old buddy. Why don't you get in here and pick it up? <laughs> Doug teased, laughing. Then the shadow grew even larger, and Doug realized by the sheer size of whoever it was, it was not Paul. Doug reached for the sliding door when suddenly two hands punched through the frosted shower glass, shattering it to bits. Doug had no time to see who it was as the huge, callous, bloody hand clamped over his face, obscuring his sight. He slid back on the wet shower floor, trying to maintain his balance, just as the other hand grabbed the other side of his head and smashed it against the tile wall of the shower. Doug tried to scream, but it was muffled by the hand. Jason's thumbs and palm began to press down on either side of Doug's head, as Doug screamed in agony. His skull was beginning to cave in with a sickening, crunching sound as the powerful, vice-like grip of the mad killer broke through facial bones in Doug's nasal cavity. Warm blood began to cascade down his shoulders and pull at his feet. Through the agonizing pain of his face being smashed like mush, Doug tried to swing his fist frantically, but it was of no use. The hand slammed him back into the wall, put both hands on either side of Doug's head, and pulled him forward, slamming his throat down on the broken edge of the shower door, the glass impaling his neck and ending his life quickly. 
The blood dripped down the walls and swirled around before disappearing into the drain as Jason heard the soft humming of Sarah in the other room. Sarah hit the off switch on the blow dryer and placed it on the dresser, giving her damp hair a good tassel. She tightened the towel around her nude body and looked at herself proudly in the mirror. You did it, she thought, your first time and it went perfectly. What had she been so scared of? Would Doug have hurt you, she thought. Now she knew why Sam teased her all the time. That's what everyone was so scared of? It was great, it was fun, it was relaxing, and there was nothing scary about it. Sure, it hurt a little, but after a while, it wouldn't hurt at all. Doug had been so gentle with her. He was such a great guy. He had asked her before they started doing it if she was comfortable, if she was ready, and really made sure she wanted to do it beforehand. I'm so lucky, Sarah thought. She couldn't wait to tell Sam and see the look on her face when she found out her best friend just had sex. Sam would be so proud of her, she thought. Sarah primped in the mirror, laughing out loud in jubilancy feeling like a new person. She started to think about a future with Doug. After all, they had just graduated and some choices were going to have to be made. Where was she going to go? Her parents had started a college fund, but it wasn't much. She wanted to live with Doug now that they'd consummated their relationship, but she didn't think she'd be able to afford rent. Maybe if they both got jobs and had a crappy apartment for a while. But then school was expensive too, and then she didn't know what Doug was even planning after high school. He talked about doing construction, but she hated that it was so dangerous. Maybe they could go to college together if they got jobs as soon as one opened up back in their town, or maybe get a scholarship. She thought about talking to Doug about it, but then again, things were great, and she was totally worry-free. She didn't feel like getting into a serious conversation with him. She finished making up the bottom bunk and walked out into the hallway, stopping outside the closed bathroom door. I came to hear you sing, Sarah said through the door. There was no response. She frowned. Doug, she said. She pushed open the bathroom door and froze. Doug was slumped forward, halfway dangling out of the shower, a jagged shard of frosted glass impaling his throat. There was so much blood all over the shower walls, completely painting the inside of the shower and the floor in front of it. It was something out of one of her worst nightmares, and it was right in front of her. Sarah let out a blood-curdling scream, throwing her hands to her face as adrenaline trip-hammered through her system. Sam! It's Samantha! Oh my god! She shrieked, hurtling herself down the hallway away from the horrible sight and careening down the stairs two at a time in a panic. She sprinted through the living room, saw the blood stain and ripped projector screen, and screamed. Oh my god, Sam! Sam! Sam, somebody help me! <laughs> Sarah screamed again, throwing herself at the front door. It wouldn't budge. The back door was her only other option. Just as Sarah started to make a run for it, the front door imploded inwards, the wood splintering to give way for the blade of an axe as it lodged itself in Sarah's chest. Sarah was thrown backwards by the force of the blow, hitting the floor, the axe protruding from her chest. She stared incredulously at the blood blossoming, soaking the towel and pulling around her. And eventually, her body stopped trembling, and her panicked breathing came to a stop. Final showdown. 
Tommy swept the beam of the flashlight down the basement staircase, listening to the storm howling outside and his own heavy breathing. He hated going down into the basement, the smell, the sounds he heard while he was down there, the cobwebs, the rats you could hear scurrying in the wall. It terrified him. Tommy didn't like being scared, even though he could sit in his room for hours and design the most realistic and terrifying masks. It was just that his mask didn't scare him. They were just a manifestation of all his real-life fears, except he was in control. Sure, his 12-year-old mind didn't really grasp it, but still, he could manipulate the mask how he wanted and make it do exactly what he wanted, but he couldn't control what happened down in the cellar. He couldn't control the cockroaches running under his feet or the spider webs that brushed across his face. He couldn't control the shadows dancing around, and he couldn't control it if something was lurking in the dark down there, waiting to jump out and eat him alive, watching his every move, smelling his fear, waiting to rip him apart limb by limb and devour him, a monster just like from those movies that he watches. Tommy hated not being in control. When they were robbed back in the city, Tommy hadn't been in control. Someone had violated the sanctity of their tiny studio apartment and taken what was rightfully theirs, and it terrified him. Tommy hated that feeling, the feeling of real, raw terror. All he had done when it had happened was hide in the bathroom closet and cry, and wait until someone came home. He hadn't even tried to stop the creep. He had no control in the situation. He was trapped in the horrifying plot and could not escape or change his destiny. When he made his mask, he felt like he was in control again. That's how they came out so detailed. It was amazing to be able to manipulate every single feature of the mask. The shading under the eyes, the wrinkles in the skin, the sickly yellow shades of rot on the fangs that protruded out from the gaping jaws, the white shimmer in the iris of its eye. He just did them for fun, mostly, but sometimes he would catch himself dreaming and fantasizing before he went to sleep at night about possibly being on the set of a big Hollywood movie, like Godzilla or Raiders of the Lost Ark, or working on the special effects. He wasn't ever scared of the movies that he watched, either. He was a huge fan of Indiana Jones and Godzilla, of course, but also Preacher of the Black Lagoon, It Came from Beneath the Sea, and King Kong. The movies didn't scare him because, in a sense, he understood them. He had volume after volume of film encyclopedias that would explain in detail how films worked and how the special effects were set up to make it look so convincingly real. What he couldn't understand was the terror in the real world, what humans do to one another every day. That was the true horror. It was a paralyzing fear that gripped him. It had made him feel like someone was squeezing his heart so tightly that it would burst. It was the fear that had happened that day when the house had been burglarized. He remembered the utter panic of hearing the hinges snap on the front door and heavy footsteps coming down the hall. He couldn't think straight. His mind had screamed at him to get out of the house or to grab a baseball bat. But instead, his body had gone into full flight mode and he found himself huddling down in the bathroom closet with the door locked. With that kind of fear, there was no reasoning. Reasoning wasn't even an option. He had just gone with his first primal instinct that came to him, to run, to hide, to bury himself down under blankets and never come out, and hope that the horror outside would go away. He could have scared the guy off, but fear overtook him. It made him question every time he laughed at a character in a monster movie making a stupid decision. When you were in a situation like that, you didn't think clearly. He wasn't in control. That's why he hated the basement. That's why he hated the outside world. It was too sporadic for him. He couldn't control it, like he could with his mask and with his monster movies. In Godzilla, he knew what would happen at the end. There were no surprises. But what was outside the cabin door of his family's home, there was no controlling it. Life sometimes just happened, and there wasn't a thing you could do to stop it. That was why he stayed engrossed in his films and his video games and his monster masks. It was a world of his own that he had created, and he could see everything coming. Life wasn't always that way. And now life was happening to him, and he didn't like it at all. The lights were out. Trish was out looking for Mom, and he was in the house all alone, he thought. He was staring precariously down the basement stairs, trying to steady the beam of the flashlight, and trying to muster up his courage. Tommy took a deep breath and stepped on the first step, the wood sagging and squeaking under his feet. 
The sour smell of mold reached his nostrils, and he grimaced at the sight of a rat moving through the beam of his flashlight, two beady little eyes glowing in the dark. He arched the flashlight around his head, illuminating the silvery sheen of cobwebs strung across the beams above him. He reached the bottom of the staircase and moved through the dark and cluttered cellar, trying not to notice the bugs and the spiders, trying to block out the sound of the rats squeaking in the fright and seeking shelter. He pushed open a small crawlspace door, squeezed through, and his flashlight beam came to rest on the fuse box. Every time the lights had gone out before during a storm, Trish and his mom always made him be the one to go down and fix it. Tommy do this. Tommy kill this spider. Tommy go fix the lights. Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. It was all they ever said, and it made sense to him. When his dad left, his mom had looked at him and told him with tearful eyes that he was the man of the house now, and it resonated with him. Of course, what did that mean? At first, it had meant nothing, just another stray comment from his mother. But now, he had started to realize it was sort of his responsibility. Of course, his father had only been in a portion of his life, and he never really taught him how to be a true man. He only taught him how to fix a car and ride a bike and other typical boy stuff, but never how to actually handle situations like a man, like the head of the household should do, and that scared him too. He hadn't been the man of the house when someone had broken in. He'd have to teach himself. But what did being the man of the house even mean? What would he have to do? It seemed like such an overwhelming responsibility to undertake and a huge burden for him to have to be under. Tommy didn't know what he would do in a really bad situation if one were to happen again. To be perfectly honest, they lived out in the country and nothing all that bad happened anyway. What could he do? How could he take up so, so much responsibility? Just like that. He was 12. He had no idea how to make someone feel better when they were crying or what to say to calm people down or what to do in these awful situations that life inevitably brought. And now he felt a tiny seed of raw terror in his gut as he proceeded towards the fuse box. Where was his mom? And where was Trish? Tommy flipped the breaker switch and let out a sigh of relief as he heard the lights flickering on throughout the house. Then a rustling sound came from a dark shadow of the room, and Tommy didn't even turn around to shine his flashlight in the direction. He scrambled back through the crawl space door, bolted up the staircase, and slammed the basement door shut, fastening the lock. He let out a sigh of relief just as he heard the front door bang open, and the storm rumbling outside come rushing into the cabin. Tommy dashed into the foyer as he met Trish, frantically running into the kitchen to meet him. Rob came in shortly behind her, wielding a machete. Both of them were soaked from the rain and wide-eyed with fear. They slammed the cabin door shut and locked it. Tommy, thank God, she said, hugging him tightly. Tommy could see the panic in her eyes. Trish, what's going on? Tommy asked fearfully. Tommy, is Mom back yet? No, not yet, Tommy said. Trish gave Rob a look, her eyes wide with worry, and she made a beeline for the telephone in the kitchen. I'm going to call for help, Trish said, hurriedly rotating the dial. There was no dial tone when she put the receiver to her ear, and the color drained from her face. Rob, what's going on? Tommy asked, fear starting to take over. The storm must have blown the phone lines down, Rob said. I'm going to go next door. Jason could be killing them one by one, he thought. He had to stop him. What the trio didn't see was the hulking figure just outside the kitchen door, the broken phone box in his hand, ripped from the wall of the cabin like it was a toy. Trish slammed the phone down in frustration. I'm going with you. No, Rob said staunchly. It isn't safe. Trish stepped closer, looking him in the eyes. I'm going with you, she said more resolutely. She turned to Tommy and grabbed him by the shoulders. She didn't want to tell him anything and didn't want to scare him anymore. So she did her best to convey the seriousness of the situation with her eyes. Tommy, stay here and lock the doors, okay? Hold the fort, Tommy, Rob said, and they both ran for the door. As Tommy stood there flabbergasted and scared out of his mind. He judged from their manic behavior that this was real and it was happening, and he was galvanized into action running frantically to make sure every door was locked. Trish stopped suddenly before they went out the front door and saw Gordon perched on the couch. She motioned him to follow. They had to get out of there, she thought. They had to somehow get everyone out of the rental house and into the car, 
But come to think of it, she didn't know where her keys were. She had been holding them when she had gone down the path looking for her mom, but that was the last time she had seen them. God, they were all trapped there with that maniac, my mother that had been talking about, she thought. The reality of the situation was dawning on her slowly as they followed the narrow muddy path that led to the rental house. The rain came down like tiny bits of hell on the two of them, and lightning cracked across the sky like long incandescent skeletal fingers as they approached the now quiet vacation home. The lights were out and everything was still. There was no sign of life anymore. Trish began to feel a pang of dread in her gut as she huddled closely behind Rob. They both climbed down the porch stairs and stopped dead in their tracks. There was a huge gaping hole in the front door and shards of wood were lying all around the floor. Trish cowered behind Rob, feeling her heart begin to race. He's been here, Rob said, gripping his machete tighter. Gordon all of a sudden began to bark and snarl, baring his teeth like he was possessed. He was looking straight at the house, his hair standing up on end. "'What if he still is here?' Trish asked hysterically. "'Here, take this,' Rob said, holding out his machete. Trish shook her head, intimidated by the huge, razor-sharp blade. "'Take it!' Trish reluctantly took the machete from his hand and held it out in front of her, like it was a venomous snake." as Rob quietly pushed what was left of the front door open into the house. An eerie, oppressive silence had fallen over the once rambunctious and rowdy vacation home. It was far too quiet, and it was dark except for a bright white light coming from the main room and a loud mechanical whirring. Trish and Rob inched further into the house, seeing the still-running video camera and projector screen set up in the living room. The projector screen was ripped right through the middle and stained with red. Trish felt a chill run down her spine, and she and Rob exchanged looks. It was blood. She knew it. It was blood. This is happening, she thought. Gordon started to whimper, growling menacingly. Trish stroked him behind the ears, hushing him, trying to act like she wasn't scared shitless. She crept through the house behind Rob, gripping the handle of the machete so tightly her knuckles were turning white. I'm going to the basement to turn on the lights. Stay here with Gordon, Rob said. No, Trish protested. Stay here with Gordon, he demanded firmly. Trish sighed with compliance and handed him the flashlight. Here, she said. He shone the light into a small alcove at the end of the hall and walked further inside, the beam coming to rest on the half-open basement door. Trish could see the beads of sweat trickling down his forehead, and his chest heaving. He was trying hard to mask his fear, but she could tell he was scared shitless as well. Rob whipped his bowie knife out of his pocket, held it out defensively, and tried to keep a steady hand on the wavering beam of light. He nudged open the door and shone the flashlight down into the musty, dark interior of the basement. Trish watched in fearful anticipation as he started down the basement steps, eventually disappearing into the darkness. She felt another chill across her bare arm as she realized she was now alone in the hallway. Where the hell was Gordon? She tightened her grip on the machete, looking all around her for any sign of the dog. God, I know he's here, she thought, her mind racing and fluttering with panicked thoughts. That maniac was here. She just knew something was horribly wrong. It was so quiet in the rental house, a deathly still silence that unnerved her. And then she heard a whimpering. It was Gordon, and he was scared to death. Trish hurried back into the living room towards the sound just in time to see Gordon go sprinting up the staircase to the second floor, whining the whole way, his tail tucked between his legs. Gordon! Trish shouted in a strained whisper. Gordon! Then there was the sound of breaking glass in silence. Trish glanced at the basement stairs and then back at the upstairs hallway where Gordon had just vanished. She held the machete out in front of her, ready to strike, an inch towards the stairs. Her heart was about to burst through her chest, and her hands were clammy and trembling. Every hair on her body was standing on its end, and she felt the lump in her throat growing to the size of the one in her gut, screwing tighter and tighter, until it felt like someone was hitting her repeatedly in the stomach as hard as they possibly could. It's all a misunderstanding, she kept telling herself. His body was stolen. Jason's body was stolen, and that's why it's missing. Bodies get stolen all the time. Jason is dead. This was all some joke. 
she kept picturing all the teenagers jumping out of their hiding spots yelling surprise and laughing at their hilarious joke, hoping that her fantasy would come true. But this felt all too real. A voice in the back of her mind kept telling her Rob was right, and she was fighting desperately not to listen. She glanced at the bloody projector screen, trying to convince herself that it wasn't blood. Trish precariously began to climb the staircase, listening to every creak on the floorboards and watching every fleeting shadow. She reached the second floor hallway and pushed open one of the bedroom doors to reveal an empty room. Gordon! she yelled. Gordon! She saw another door that stood wide open, and when she looked inside, she gasped at the broken glass littering the floor. Gordon had broken through one of the windows in the bedroom. Trish's blood ran cold. Something or someone spooked the shit out of him. Trish instantaneously felt everything in her body telling her to run and get the hell out of that house. Get out! Run! He's here! Jason is here! Her mind screamed at her. She started to move for the stairs and then she froze. From where she was standing, she could see straight into the open bathroom and she saw the red on the floor, the crimson red staining the tile. Trish didn't know why she didn't run. Something, some kind of primal animalistic curiosity was drawing her towards the slightly ajar bathroom door. She made her way towards the bathroom, pushed open the door, and her stomach sank into her feet at what she saw. It was Sarah, strung up from the bathroom ceiling light like a slab of meat, an axe protruding from her chest. Blood stained the white towel wrapped around her naked body and dribbled down her leg, pulling below her dangling feet. Doug's nude, blood-soaked corpse was propped up in the closet. What was left of his face was twisted in a frozen, soundless scream, a carving knife impelled through his throat. The room was flooded and the floor was covered in several inches of water mixed with the red of blood that swirled down the drain under Sarah's dangling corpse. Trish let out a horrible, piercing shriek that erupted from her throat, and she instinctively went careening in a blind panic down the staircase. "'Rob! Rob! He's here! Rob!' she screamed, panic-stricken and inconsolably hysterical, bolting down the stairs and through the main room, almost tripping on the projector cables. She ran into the hallway and down the basement stairs where Rob met her coming the other way. "'Trish! Trish! What's the matter?' Rob asked, frantically trying to calm her. She was incoherent at this point, a blubbery, sobbing mess. Rob, he's here. They're all dead. He's killed them all. I know it. Trish stammered hysterically, petrified beyond reality. Rob gave her one horrified look and grabbed her hand, pulling her up the stairs. Come on, let's get the hell out of here, he said. All of a sudden, there was the sound of splintering wood, and the rickety basement staircase gave way, sending Rob's left foot slamming through and wedging down in the beams below the steps. Shit, give me a hand, Rob exclaimed, trying in a desperate attempt to free his foot. Trish yanked on his leg with all of her strength, tears streaming down her face. His foot finally gave way, and they started back up the stairs, when Rob suddenly went back down on an impulse. Wait, my knife, he said. Trish tried to stop him, sobbing with fear. No! She shrieked. It was too late. Rob was running back down into the darkened basement. No! No, Rob! Let's just go, Rob! Trish screamed. She scrambled down the steps just in time to see someone else was in the basement with them. For a split second, Trish saw him, illuminated by the moonlight filtering in through the basement window. She saw the huge man in the tattered work suit and goalie mask lunge at Rob and heave him into a row of shells, smashing it to bits. Rob cried out in pain as Trish screamed bloody murder. Trish, run! Run, Trish! Oh, God! Rob screamed. Do something! Trish's mind was yelling at her, but her body wouldn't let her. She was frozen, her body racked with unimaginable horror. All she could do was watch in helpless, paralyzing terror at the bottom of the stairs as Jason grabbed a gardening fork off of a shelf in a wild blur and began to hack at Rob mercilessly. Time seemed to slow down as Trish could see his monstrous arm slashing rapidly and violently and all the blood, and she heard Rob's cries of agony. She screamed and screamed over and over again until her throat was raw, trying to get Jason's attention, trying to make him stop, but he was savagely swinging at Rob again and again in an unstoppable rage. He's killing me! 
Trish, he's killing me! Run! Run! Rob bellowed in pain. Finally, Trish's instincts surged through her body, and she spun around, scrambling up the staircase as fast as she could, and stopping at the top to look back down. Rob's screams had stopped, and there was nothing but an unbearable silence. She began to hyperventilate, her mind racing. She couldn't just leave. She had to do something. She couldn't leave him down there to die. She mustered up every ounce of strength and courage in her and ran back down the basement steps, stopping dead in her tracks halfway down. Trish could barely make out Rob's mangled body on the floor in the moonlight. She saw the bright red blood flowing from the gaping wound in his head and let out a horrified sob. Rob, she whimpered, tears streaming down her face. A wave of nausea had begun to hit her at the sight of Rob's mutilated body and she held back her instinct to gag. Then she felt the terror and panic kick in. That maniac was still down there, and she realized it was such force that she slammed back up the staircase as fast as she could. Just as she reached the top, a filthy hand reached through the hole where Rob's leg had broken through and grabbed her by the ankle. Trish shrieked, looked down, and saw two demented eyes staring at her through the eye holes of the mask. Suddenly, the machete wasn't a poisonous snake anymore, and she swung it as hard as she could, screaming bloody murder, satisfied at the sight of the rusty blade slashing into Jason's wrist and the bloody gashes opening in his disgusting, grimy flesh. Jason growled in pain and released his grip on her ankle, and Trish bolted up the stairs and slammed the basement door shut. Get the fuck out of here! Get Tommy and get the fuck out of here! Trisha's mind urged, and she ran through the house to the front door, yanking it open. She cupped her hands in her mouth in horror and disgust at what she saw. It was Tina, wet from the rain, sprawled on the doorstep. Her neck was twisted at such an unnatural angle, and her eyes were bugging out of her skull. Trish recoiled with shock and backed away into the living room, stumbling over the projector cables again, the panic of the situation beginning to overtake her. She looked towards the basement door and heard him, thundering up the stairs, and with a look of sheer dread, her instinct snapped her back to reality. Trish sprinted for the kitchen in a panic, threw open the back door and screamed at the top of her lungs. It was Jimmy, crucified to the doorframe. Four huge spikes nailed through his hands and feet, a huge gash in the middle of his face. She brought her hands to her face and screamed, hyperventilating, and then, looking frantically for a way out, she saw the kitchen window above the sink. Trish didn't have time to unlock it and open it. Jason was coming through the living room, looking for her, smashing things in his path. She snatched up a chair from the table and hurled it at the glass, smashing it on impact. She dropped the chair, climbed up onto the counter, and threw the machete out onto the ground first. Then she dove through the window, picked up the machete, and started running through the pouring rain towards the Jarvis house, just as Jason grabbed at her over the sill. Jason growled in anger as he watched her run, screaming, but then felt the bubbling, seething rage that threatened to consume him subside as he heard her terrified screams. Scream, just like he screamed when no one would come to save him in the lake. Scream, just like his mother had screamed. Feel the terror that he felt. Feel the horror and helplessness. Feel the anguish that his mother felt about losing him. Feel the anger and heartbreak. He had watched her see Rob being murdered, just like he watched his mother be decapitated that night on the shore of the lake. She still had to die. Hearing her horrified screaming eased the rage within him, but it was back in a matter of seconds. Jason walked towards the back door and ripped Jimmy from the doorframe, the nails tearing through his hands, and his lifeless body was hurled several feet through the air like it was made of cardboard. He headed straight for the Jarvis house with the insatiable lust to kill, driving him forward.
Tommy heard the frantic hammering on the front door and the panic screaming and ran to open it. Trish scrambled inside, slamming the front door and locking it. She was drenched in rain and hysterical, splattered with the flecks of Rob's blood still clutching the bloody machete in her trembling hand. Tommy, are all the doors locked? Yes, Tommy replied, his eyes wide. I need you to get me a hammer and nails right now, Trish ordered firmly, setting the machete down by the door. All of the color drained from Tommy's face when she saw just how terrified Trish was. Tommy, go get the hammer and nails now, she screamed frantically. They didn't have any time, her mind screamed. He would be here any minute. The key, she thought, no time. She didn't know where they were. She ran into the living room and began to make her rounds, locking every window and bolting every door. She saw the newspaper clippings and the artist sketch of young Jason Voorhees on the table and realized Tommy knew all about him. Tommy was in and out of the laundry room in two seconds, hurrying into the foyer with the hammer and nails. As she saw the look in his eyes, she knew that he had read the articles. Trish took a nail and began driving it into the front door, securing it to the frame, and then started with another. No way she was letting this old door hold Jason by itself. Trish could picture Jason being able to break through it like paper. She tried to focus on securing the door, but she kept seeing the blood and the bodies in Rob's lifeless form just lying there over and over in her head. It was throbbing in her head. This can't be happening, she thought, as she pounded in the last knell and backed away from the door, shaking with fear. Trish, Tommy started to say, the inevitable reality of the situation beginning to hit him in one overwhelming rush. Tommy, it's going to be okay. Just go make sure all the windows are locked, Trish said, trying her best to console him. But even she had a horrible feeling this would probably all be in vain. Jason had killed that entire group of kids and Rob. Trish knew they probably didn't stand a chance. He was going to come for both of them and kill them like he killed all the others. Trish didn't want to think that her own mother was dead and that soon they might be dead, but she knew the horrible truth all too well. Tommy didn't move. He was standing by the staircase watching the front door with huge eyes, ravaged with the horror of what he was realizing. They had to get out. They had to run to the main road. They had to get away. All of a sudden, they both leaped out of their skin as the huge picture window in the living room imploded inwards, and Rob's blood-soaked corpse came crashing down on the hardwood floor. The gardening fork was embedded in his skull. Trish screamed as Tommy just stood frozen in shock at the sight. Rob, Trish said, her eyes wet with tears. She bent down and shook him slightly, a tiny sliver of hope in her that he was still alive. But he didn't budge. Then Trish heard another deafening crash, and she sprang to her feet to see a terrifying sight. Tommy had backed into the other huge window in the room, and Jason was now reaching through the shattered glass, his arms wrapped around Tommy's tiny form, and pulling him through the window. Trish! Trish! He's got me! Trish! Let me go! Tommy screamed at the top of his lungs. Trish screamed a battle cry, snatched up the hammer from the floor, and ran to the window. She looked at Jason dead and his hate-filled eyes through the holes of that hockey mask, and she began to swing the hammer at his head, delivering solid blows, but Jason didn't budge. It barely phased him. She was bashing him as hard as she could, but he didn't seem to feel a thing. She could smell the acrid body odor and his stinking hot breath through the mask. She saw his eyes again, and she caught the loathing, the hatred. She didn't have time to think about it, because he was reeling back to drag Tommy's comparatively tiny body through the glass. In a last frantic effort, Trish swung the other end of the hammer with all of her might at Jason's head, and the two claws of the hammer buried themselves in the side of Jason's neck, right under his left ear. Jason growled in pain, finally releasing his grip on Tommy and staggering back out into the night. Trish wrapped both of her arms around Tommy and pulled him safely into the house. With two hands, Jason ripped the hammer out and began stalking towards the front door. Trish saw him walking towards the door, and in a flash, she grabbed Tommy's hand and yanked him towards the staircase. Just as they stopped at the bottom of the stairs, the front door exploded inwards, and Jason came smashing through like a bull. He had just walked right through it. Tommy's jaw dropped as he saw the deranged killer who was now in the living room with them. He was unstoppable. 
They both watched in disbelief as Jason reared back and hurled the hammer at them. It whistled through the air and impelled itself in the doorframe right beside Trish's head. Then he advanced towards them, his hulking figure looming upon them, his crazed eyes boring into Trish's soul. Follow me up, Tommy screamed, running up the staircase with Trish not far behind. She followed Tommy frantically into his room. They heard Jason thundering up the steps after them and quickly closed the door, bolting it. Trish frantically searched for a way to barricade the door, and then she grabbed Tommy's tall wooden armoire that he used to shelve all of his masks and action figures, sliding it across the floor in front of the door. "'Tommy, help me!' she said. The two of them managed to heave the enormous dresser in front of the door and backed away from it, crouching down and hugging each other tightly in the middle of the room, waiting to see what would happen." There were a few seconds of agonizing silence, and then the door began to rattle and quake violently. Tommy screamed, tears finding their way down his cheeks as Trish hugged him tighter, trying to keep him calm. She was starting to lose it as well, her heart racing, tears streaming down her face as her mind desperately attempted to figure out what to do. After a few more seconds of Jason shaking and banging on the door, it suddenly got quiet. It was another maddening silence. God, what is he doing? Trish wondered aloud, still holding the petrified and trembling Tommy tightly against her chest. She expected something, anything to happen, but nothing did. Everything was quiet. And then out of nowhere, there was the sound of splintering wood and an axe smashing through the door. Tommy screamed in fright, and Trish tried to cover his mouth with her hands, but it was no use. Jason knew exactly where they were. Jason swung the axe again, and all Trish and Tommy could do was watch in horror as the barrier keeping them inside and Jason outside was being destroyed. Seeing Jason start to reach his arm into the room, Trish knew she had to act fast. They were trapped like cage animals. He was going to kill them in this room. She had to knock the bastard out long enough for them to make a fucking run for it. It was their only chance of survival. It had to be something to incapacitate him. There was no going up against him with an axe. Trish scanned the room madly for a weapon. The knife replicas on Tommy's wall weren't sharp enough. There was a baseball bat in the corner, but it was made of foam. Oh, fuck, she thought. Then she turned her head towards Tommy's desk, and her eyes lit up madly. Trish ran to the desk and lifted Tommy's computer monitor off the desk and heaved it into the air, carrying it across the room on her shoulder. Jason was shoving the dresser out of the way, reaching his head and arm into the room. He never saw it coming. Trish slammed the monitor down on his head with all of her strength and watched the sparks fly. Jason's body convulsed wildly as smoke began to fill the room. Trish ran back over to Tommy and shielded him from the sparks, putting up her own hands to deflect them from herself. The monitor crashed to the floor and Jason staggered back into the hallway with a dazed groan crashing to the floor like a fallen tree. Then it was silence again, and Trish and Tommy didn't dare move or make a sound, listening and waiting to see if he was really dead. Jason didn't get up. Smoke still lingered in the air. Trish stood to her feet, gestured for Tommy to stay, and inched towards the door, looking through the gaping hole in the bedroom door. Jason was lying motionless, but Trish could see his chest rising and falling, and his head still reeling from the blow. He was just unconscious. They didn't have much time. She motioned for Tommy to come to the door, and when he came, she grabbed him by the shoulders and looked him dead in the eyes. Tommy, I'm going to get him out of the house, and when I do, I want you to run like hell. Do you hear me? You run like hell, Trish said, clenching her teeth in a hushed whisper careful not to wake the unconscious killer, sprawled in the hallway just a foot away. He had to make a run for it. It was their only hope. Tommy was faster than her, and if he could make it to the nearest house, he could call the police and send them here. Tommy nodded in response, still shaking like a leaf. Trish quietly opened what was left of the door and stepped out into the hallway. She lifted her foot as quietly as she could and stepped over the hulking killer on the floor in front of her. She held her breath and stepped further over him, creeping around him to finally get to the other side, not daring to make any noise, exchanging tight glances with Tommy. 
Just as she passed him and started to move for the staircase, Jason shot upright, picked up the dropped axe, and swung it at Trish. Trish! Tommy cried. The axe embedded itself in the wall, nicking Trish's right shoulder in the process, tearing through the blue cotton dress and ripping her flesh. As Jason struggled to pry the axe from the wall, Trish shrieked and lurched forward down the hallway, grabbing hold of the banister for support as she looked incredulously at the blood beginning to flow from the gash on her arm. Jason gave up on the axe and started to head for Tommy, who backed away in fear, shaking his head, pleading. No! Tommy! Trish screamed. Chase me, you son of a bitch! she thought. Jason turned to Trish and then back to Tommy and then back to Trish, as if he were deciding who to go after first. No, Trish! Tommy yelled, but Trish kept urging him on. No! Trish screamed. Leave him alone! Jason complied. He charged at Trish with full force, and Trish screamed, rolling around and running down the staircase, hearing Tommy urging her on above her. Trish bolted for the front door, leaping through what was left of it, and ran out into the pouring rain. She spun around and saw Jason barreling out of the house towards her. That's right, chase me, you fucker, Trish thought. She had to get him away from the house so Tommy could get out of there. She ran as fast as she could down the muddy path, keeping as much distance as she could between them. Jason was hot on her trail. Trish looked over her shoulder to see Jason coming up on her horrifyingly fast, barreling across the yard like a pro quarterback. She shrieked at the sight of the hockey mask right behind her and ran faster, almost slipping in the mud, making a mad dash towards the only place she knew to go, back down the path towards the rental house. She jumped over Tina's bloodied body lying on the porch, not even registering the sight, and scrambled into the house, not bothering to close the door. Jason was right behind her. She stopped at the foot of the stairs and turned around, seeing Jason standing there in the doorway his huge form blocking out the light from the moon outside. His shoulders were heaving. He was fuming, his eyes glaring at her with that insatiable lust to kill, full of blazing fury that threatened to explode out of him at any moment. She bolted up the stairs, because it happened so fast. The next thing Trish knew, Jason was running at her again, and she screamed. Jason, just an arm's reach behind her, growling as she ran down the hallway, coming to the end and turning around to see the madman at the top of the stairs, those demented, unblinking eyes still staring at her. It was a standoff. Trish stared back, hyperventilating and sobbing, pleading with him. She wanted to try to evoke any kind of sympathy that she could out of this maniac, but she knew it was no use. He was an unstoppable monster, and there was nothing she could do. He kept staring her down, his eyes devoid of any empathetic response or emotion. She was trapped at the end of the hallway like a caged animal, awaiting slaughter. Shrinking back into the corner with fear, Trish backed away, shaking her head. God, please just leave us alone. Please don't hurt Tommy, she thought. Jason didn't flinch. He charged at her. Trish instinctively turned, looking for a place to run, and she saw the large picture window at the end of the hall. It was her only shot. With a scream and a quick split second to brace herself, she ran towards the window, made a flying leap, and threw herself at the glass. Fortunately, the glass smashed through on impact, and Trish went flying through the window and through the air, hitting the porch roof, smashing through the wooden balcony railing, and landing hard on her back in the mud. Jason leaned through the shattered window and looked down at Trish, lying on her back on the muddy ground, motionless. Trish struggled to breathe for a moment. The wind knocked out of her, squinting through the rain falling down on her face. She could barely see him staring down at her from the window, and she held her breath tightly, hoping he would think she was dead. The second she saw him disappear into the rental house, Trish slowly started to pull herself to her feet as fast as she could and started running back towards home. She could feel the pain in her right leg that was shooting all the way up towards her thigh, but she ignored it, the adrenaline rush completely blocking all other sensations out. She could see the blood on her arms from where the glass had cut her, but she didn't care. She had to get back to the house and try to get away. She saw the car sitting under the tree in its usual spot. Maybe Tommy wasn't too far ahead and she could catch up with him in the car. That is, if he made it out of the house. It probably wouldn't even work, but she had to try. 
the keys had to be hanging in the kitchen. Trish clambered up the front porch steps of their log cabin, dragging her pained ankle behind her, and hobbled into the front room, staring down at what was left of the front door. Tommy, she called into the quiet house. She heard his voice call out from upstairs. God damn it, Trish thought. Tommy, you were supposed to leave. Trish screamed hysterically through tears. What the hell was he doing up there? Suddenly, out of the corner of her eyes, she saw it. Jason coming through the front door behind her. She could hear his boots thudding softly across the floor, and she smelled him, that awful stench of sweat and filth, and heard the deep labored breathing. He was in the house. Trish froze, searching her surroundings for a weapon. Rob's machete was leaning against the wall by the door. She discreetly grabbed for the machete, and just as Jason reached out to grab her, Trish swung around, the machete blade slicing through the air and just missing his head, cutting into the door frame. Trish yanked the machete out of the wooden frame and backed into the dining room, Jason advancing menacingly towards her. His eyes were wide. He was angrier than ever. She swung the machete again and missed, smashing a picture frame on the wall. She swung again, and Jason jumped back to avoid the blade. Stay away from me, Trish screamed, swinging at him again. He reached for her arms outstretched. Trish swung, and this time she made contact. The blade sliced into his left hand, right between the knuckles of Jason's middle and ring finger. Jason growled in pain and yanked his arm back instinctively. He held up his hand, staring with his head tilted psychotically at the blood spurting from the gaping wound that had almost split his hand in half. Trish looked on in horror, shock, and relief that she had actually hit him, but that soon faded. The wound hardly fazed him. He lunged at her again and Trish screamed, looping around the dining room table and running into the living room. Tommy, get the hell out of here! Trish screamed up the staircase and leaped back to avoid another grab from Jason. No! She screamed. She swung the machete and missed. Jason kept coming, completely unafraid of the razor-sharp blade slashing at him. You son of a bitch, I'll give you something to remember us by! Trish said through clenched teeth, her fear quickly bubbling up into anger. She reared back like a slugger and swung the machete like a baseball bat. The blade lodged deep in Jason's chest. He didn't flinch. Jason snarled with rage, and with a single swipe of his hand knocked Trish to the floor. She screamed as Jason lunged at her, climbing on top of her and pinning her to the floor. Trish hysterically began to fight with everything in her. She kicked, screamed, clawed, but to no avail. He was huge and he was too powerful. The stench of his body odor was making her gag. His hands were grabbing for her throat. He straddled her and she started punching him in his mask, hammering the tough plastic with all of the strength she had left in her. It was no use. It was not affecting him. He was going to kill her right there, right there on her own living room floor, leaving her bloodied, mangled body there for Tommy to see and have that image of his sister ingrained in his brain forever. God, you bastard, just please spare Tommy. Please don't hurt him, she thought, her life flashing through her eyes. Time seemed to slow down as she began to picture all the things he could do to her. Would he do other things to her, torture her, rape her? No, Trish thought in horror. She saw the look in his demented eyes and knew exactly what he was planning to do. He took both of his hands and wrapped them around Trish's throat, clamping down and strangling the life out of her. He was going to kill her plain and simple. Trish couldn't scream, and she felt her body going weak from the loss of oxygen. She clawed at his hands, tried to pry them free from her neck, but it was hopeless. And then, almost by godsend, a voice rang out loud and clear. Jason! Jason! The voice bellowed. It was inhuman, it was filled with anger, but still held the youthfulness of a child. It was Tommy's voice, Trish realized, but something was different. Jason, the voice continued, until finally Jason stopped strangling Trish and looked up at the staircase. Trish glanced up as well and saw her brother standing there, his head almost completely shaved. Tommy stared at Jason in the eyes, through the holes in the hockey mask. Jason... Remember me? Tommy asked, walking closer to Jason, talking in a soothing, hypnotic voice. 
God, no, Tommy, Tommy, what the hell are you doing? Get the hell out of here! Trisha's mind screamed. Run, save yourself! She tried to signal to him with her eyes to run and get the fuck out, but Tommy's eyes were transfixed on Jason. What was he doing? She scrunched up her face in bewilderment. Then she realized what he was doing and she was in awe. He looked like... He looked just like the artist's sketch in the newspaper of Jason as a little boy. It was almost as if he recreated the sketch to a T. He had put foundation on to make his face look deathly and pale and made dark circles around his eyes. He had shaved his head, but not completely, leaving sparse patches of hair like in the photo. He had cut his jeans off at the knee like the shorts the little boy was wearing. It was almost like he was creating one of his masks or one of his action figures. He was young Jason Voorhees. Trish tried to say something, but Tommy gave her a knowing look. She knew exactly what he was doing. She saw Tommy's eyes flicker over towards the machete discarded on the rug, and Trisha's mind clicked into place. It was a distraction, and it was working. Jason was either confused or intrigued and was just kneeling motionless, cocking his head to the side like some kind of confused and curious animal, staring at Tommy, staring at what looked like himself as a child in a silent daze. Trish, this is your chance, her mind screamed. Jason rose to his feet and stared at Tommy, almost in a trance. Jason, remember what you were, Jason, don't you remember? Tommy said, drawing Jason closer and closer, until they were in arm's reach apart. It was working. My God, it was working, Trish thought excitedly. It was putting the bastard in some kind of trance. It was working. Trish had to act fast before Jason realized their plan. She quietly but quickly snatched the machete up from the floor and crept behind Jason, slowly bringing the machete back over her shoulder. She wasn't fast enough as he heard her quiet and furtive footsteps and spun around, snapping out of it and leering at her. Trish panicked as she saw the utter loathing in those eyes and swung the machete at his head with all of her might. Her panicking had caused her to miss her mark, but the machete grazed Jason's mask, knocking it off his head and sending it flying. What was under the mask made Trish recoil in pure, unadulterated repulsion and terror, and the machete fell from her hands onto the wooden floor. He didn't even look human. His features were distorted and grotesque. His skin was graying and decayed, covering it in oozing sores. It was ten times more horrifying than any of Tommy's masks. This wasn't made of rubber. This was all too real. He was a monster. Trish cupped her hands to her mouth in sheer shock and disgust and fell backwards onto the floor, scuttling backwards and shaking her head, pleading as Jason advanced towards her. All she could do was watch helplessly. His mouth opened, revealing a set of broken and rotting teeth. It was something out of a nightmare. What happened next, Trish didn't see coming. She heard Tommy's voice scream Jason's name with a fury that she didn't know Tommy had in him. When Jason turned to face Tommy, Tommy swung the machete at the side of Jason's head like a pro batter. This time, it didn't miss. It buried deep into the side of Jason's skull, slicing through his deformed flesh all the way up to the hilt and cutting through the side of his left eye. Blood squirted out and dribbled down Jason's cheek. Tommy stared on in shock as Trish stood with her hands at her face, crying hysterically and hyperventilating. They both watched in terror and hopeful anticipation as Jason fell to his knees and pitched forward, landing on the machete protruding from his eye and burying the blade deeper into his skull. The grotesque abnormalities of his face were twitching and moving around, and his body began convulsing. A white foam formed at his mouth as the machete was driven even deeper through his head and out at the base of his skull, dark blood and brain matter beginning to pull around him. Jason finally hit the floor, the machete going all the way through, and laid there motionless. Trish was inconsolable, and as she saw that he was finally dead, her body began to gradually stop trembling violently, and her hyperventilating had started to slow down. She stared at Tommy in disbelief with bloodshot eyes. Tommy was frozen in astonishment, a blank, emotionless expression on his face, trying to process what had just happened. It was over. It was all over. 
The initial shock of it slowly resolved into an overwhelming relief that washed over both of them. Trish sprang to her feet and ran to Tommy, embracing him. Tommy began to cry into Trish's arms, turning from a killer into a scared little boy trembling, all over with fright. She wanted to say something, ask him what came over him, ask him if he was okay, but she was barely able to speak. She just wanted to hold him and tell him everything would be all right. Jason was dead. He was dead and the nightmare was over. Then, without warning, Jason's hand came to life, grabbing Trisha's ankle. She let out a bone-chilling scream and yanked her foot away. What happened next was the ultimate shock. She watched as Tommy picked up the machete, and in a split second, his tiny body went into a frenzy. He lifted the machete into the air and brought it down on Jason's body. Again, and again, and again, and again. Tommy! Tommy! Trish screamed, trying to snap him out of it. But he was in some sort of trance. She didn't even recognize him. His face was contorted in an almost inhuman way. He was screaming madly. Die! 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 Trish had never seen anything like it before. She didn't want to believe it. God, Tommy, he's dead. Tommy, he's dead! She wanted to stop it, but she couldn't. The room began to spin. She fell to her knees, her body finally giving in to an exhaustion and sank down, down into oblivion, into nothingness, into the unconscious, into visions of blood and death and shades of red and white. Tommy kept hacking away at Jason, over and over, screaming, die, 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 die. Epilogue. Trisha's eyes fluttered open and she came to, realizing she was in the living room of the house. She looked down at her clothes, seeing the blood and mud caked all over her from head to toe. Then she remembered last night and, when she took a few seconds to process everything, she let out a sob. Jason was lying on the floor in front of her, his head nothing but a mass of bloody tissue. The machete still driven through his skull up to the hilt and transfixing his body to the floor. She could see bits of brain and gore through the rotting skin, and she grimaced. The house was quiet. Tommy was nowhere in sight. Trish looked over and saw Rob still lying there on the hardwood floor in a pool of blood and broken glass. It didn't faze her. After all she had seen, after seeing Doug and Sarah and Jimmy's mangled bodies and seeing her brother hack a madman to death, she had become totally drained of all of her emotions. She slowly pulled herself to her feet, wincing in agony, as she dragged her limp ankle over to the window. Bright sunlight was flooding in through the two broken windows, and birds were chirping peacefully. Her eyes lit up as she saw the police cars coming down the winding country road. Tommy! Tommy! Let's get out of here! The police are here! Trish called, but there was no answer. She looked towards the stairs, no sign of Tommy. Tommy! She called again, still no answer. Trish stepped over Jason's unmoving body and began walking up the stairs. She got to the second floor and rounded the banister, going down to the last door on the right and pushing open what was left of Tommy's bedroom door. His room was empty. The smashed computer monitor was still on the floor. Trish stepped back, confused. Where the hell was he? The sirens outside were growing louder. Tommy! Trish started to say, when a noise caught her attention. It was the sound of running water. Then she saw the water flowing out from under the bathroom door. What the hell? She muttered, moving to the bathroom door and opening it. The bathroom was flooded. Water was up over Trish's ankles. She gasped in horror at what she saw. The bathtub was filled with blood. Her mother was lying there in the tub of blood, her eyes closed peacefully, motionless. Mom! Trish exclaimed in horror, rushing to the side of the bathtub and lifting her nude body out of the water. She cradled her lifeless mother in her arms, sobbing hysterically. 
All of a sudden, her mother came to life, grabbing Trish by the neck and squeezing. Trish tried to scream, but the hands were too strong. They were strangling her. She saw into her mother's eyes, and they opened, revealing nothing but white. Her mother's mouth opened, and a waterfall of blood erupted out. Trish recoiled, pushing her mother's hands away, finally, screaming again and again in pure terror. She sprang to her feet and ran for the bathroom door. Standing there in the bathroom doorway was Tommy, wearing the hockey mask, an axe in his hands. He swung it right at Trish's heart. Trish woke up screaming. Two hands pinned her back down to the bed and her eyes flashed open, a white light blinding her. Trisha's body relaxed as she realized she was safe. There was no dead mother, no Tommy with an axe, just a hospital room surrounded by police. She stopped screaming, seeing the concerned faces of the officers. Mrs. Jarvis, are you all right? Trish looked around the room, letting it sink in all at once, and she remembered all of it. Rob being murdered, that maniac chasing her and Tommy through the house, Tommy grabbing that machete and going absolutely batshit crazy. It all came back to her and hit her like a truck. She let out a small sob as she looked down and saw the gauze on her ankle, and the gauze wrapped around tightly on her upper arm where Jason had hit her with the axe. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, I'm okay. Where's my mother? Where's Tommy? Trish asked. She saw several pained expressions and her heart sank. Ma'am, your little brother is in the next room. He's fine. But your mother didn't make it. One officer said, stepping closer to the bed. Trish felt tears welling up and a lump forming in her throat. Is everybody dead? Yes. The only ones alive are you and the boy. Tommy did a real number on that guy, another officer remarked. Trish remembered seeing her brother kill the crazed maniac on their living room floor. She shuddered thinking about it. She'd never seen Tommy like that. It just wasn't him. That couldn't have been her brother. Is... is Tommy okay? He went crazy, Trish said. Under extreme duress, people can perform extraordinary behavior. Feats of strength, and that's what happened when your brother attacked that killer. It was normal for him to protect himself, the first officer explained. He'll be fine. What you need is some rest. Can I see him? Trish asked. Yes, we'll send him in, said the other officer with hesitation. The four policemen left the room, closing the door, and shortly after, Tommy came rushing into the room, his head still shaved completely, his clothes torn and rumpled. Tommy, Trish said with relief, embracing him. It's over. It's over. Trish didn't see the look on Tommy's face as he stared blankly at the wall behind her. His eyes were glassed over, his face drained of color, his eyes empty and soulless. Tommy could feel a white-hot intensity bubbling up within him, a rage, a burning rage that threatened to consume him. The End Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Friday the 13th, Part 4, the final chapter of the fan novelization by Landon Turner. Gotta say, I really enjoyed this fan novelization. Landon, you did a great job. From beginning to end, I think this was very well written, just as good as Simon Hawk, if I'm being honest. There were a couple, like, inconsistencies with the 80s and technology and stuff, but you know what? It's a book. It's fiction. And I think you did a great job with it. I really enjoyed getting a deeper dive into the characters, a deeper dive into Jason, having certain scenes expanded on from the book, uh, questions that we had watching the movie uh, getting answered. Um, so yeah, all in all, I really enjoyed this book. I loved the beginning, the middle, the end. Uh, I love the way you handled the conclusion. You threw in the deleted scene. 
You threw in lots of stuff, and you did a great job with that, and I hope everybody who listened to this book enjoyed it as well. I will be doing an episode of the Out of Print Slashers podcast in the future, uh, where, where me and Sean Campbell will be discussing this book in greater detail. I've also given little mini-reviews on each chapter as I've narrated them. You can listen to the playlist version of this book if you're listening to the unabridged version right now. Uh, to get those little tidbits where I where I discuss each chapter a little bit and what I thought of each chapter individually. But yeah, overall, I thought that Landon did an amazing job on this book. I really enjoy Friday the 13th Part 4. It's one of my favorites. Um, it's one of the best in the entire series, and it really did deserve a novelization. And I'm glad that Landon Turner took the time to write this for us to enjoy. And I hope everybody that's listened to it has enjoyed it just as much as I have. Um... Uh, if anybody listening wants to write novelizations for Friday the 13th, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, a novelization for Jason Goes to Hell, go for it. And I will narrate it on this channel. Uh, I would love to see more fan novelizations written uh, for the movies uh, that did not get direct uh, official novelizations uh, commissioned back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but yeah, I want to know what everybody else thought of this book. So all of you Slashaholics that uh, gave this book a listen, please let me know in the comment section what you thought. Uh, be sure to thank Landon Turner for writing this for us. Uh, he did a very great job. Uh, I'll be back very soon with more audiobook narrations, podcasts, and Slash Tracks episodes here on 80 Slasher Librarian Presents. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you soon.